So welcome back to Romance Studies 202. And um, today it is a great pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Ryan Long, my friend, old friend Ryan Long uh, from the University of, of Maryland. Um, uh, Ryan is uh, an expert on Bolaño, amongst much else, uh, Mexican uh, fiction as well. He's recently published this book on sexuality and photography in Roberto Bolaño's fiction and poetry. And so today we're going to be talking about um, uh, Bolaño, this Chilean novelist who spent a lot of time in, in, in Mexico and, and wrote uh, uh, later in, in Spain uh, and his book, Amulet. Thanks so much. Uh, for doing this, for your generosity of your time and expertise, uh, Ryan, and let's get let's get straight into it. So, how would you approach? What would be some ways in which you would frame a, a reading of this book? Well, thank you, John. It's so great to see you again, um, and it's really good to be a part of this class. And I really appreciate the invitation. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I would approach this book, or I have approached this book, first of all, by talking about 1968 in Mexico and the Mexican student movement, which took place between um, the end of July and the beginning of October of 1968. And the way that this is a novel about 1968, written or published more than 30 years after that, and written by a Chilean writer living in Spain who spent his adolescence in Mexico. And I think it's one of the best novels about 1968, and in large part because it keeps the student movement alive in a way that some other literary representations, poetry, stories, novels, films, really don't. Because a lot of those representations focus on what is known as the Massacre of Tlatelolco, which happened on October 2nd, in which hundreds of students were killed, which effectively ended the student movement. And a lot of representation in the student movement focuses more on that episode of state violence than the kind of accomplishments and energy and movement um, in a very literal way through the streets of Mexico City that the student movement actually succeeded in achieving in those months of its duration. There were demonstrations in the central square of Mexico City of more than 200,000 people. There was a demonstration on September 13th, uh, 1968. That was a march across a section of the city that was completely silent. So there was a lot of there was a lot accomplished in terms of unifying students um, across faculties, across universities, and students with workers that sometimes gets overshadowed um, by the massacre. So how does Amulet? Uh, manage to do something different? Well, it does something different by taking uh, a true story about a woman from Uruguay whose name was Alcira Soust, who was in fact trapped in the bathroom um, when the soldiers took over the university on September 13th. Uh, no, no, uh, sometime in September, the 18th, I think. Um, and she spent two weeks there until the university was freed on September 30th. And this bathroom, as you will know, having read the novel, is a space to which uh, Auxilio La Couture returns time and time again, and from which she can see the future. So it is a space of very ambiguous and flexible temporality that I think enables the moment of 1968 before the massacre to persist at least into the 70s, which is when the novel is mostly set. But also it kind of takes that creative energy of the student movement and represents it in the form of artistic expression in general, which uh, near the end of the novel goes clear into the 2100s or even later where it talks about certain ways that art gets read in the future and that art persists in the future, especially literature. And I think that this effect of making time a specific moment last throughout several years beyond its particular 10 day or 12 day duration is a way that Bolaño keeps the bravery of the student movement alive beyond the Tlatelolco massacre. And I think 
then one way to approach the novel is to contextualize it within that moment of Mexican history and within the literature of 1968. Uh, that's fantastic. So um, I, I, I like the, the idea of this sort of displacement. So yes, Tlatelolco, uh, the massacre, which is mentioned here, but it's, it's not the central point, mm -hmm. is this traumatic moment, right? For, for, for Mexican culture and, uh, and politics um, and brings to it to, to an end um, this a, a months long movement or helps to bring to an end this, this months long movement. And what Bolaño takes is this um, this little detail. I mean, I'm struck also by that, right? You yeah. know, there's this one person in a bathroom that no one notices, right? That that right. That, right. that goes that that's that's why she she manages to hide, right? She goes unseen, who's not from Mexico either, mm -hmm. right? That she she's right. Uruguayan, um, who is in the middle of things and yet can't see anything, but yet can see everything. You can right, see right. not only the past, um, uh, uh, but also the, the future. We, we were talking earlier about this, and I, I don't know if this is the point to mention that. You, you talked about the way in which there's something sort of uh, connected to science fiction here. She calls that mm -hmm. bathroom a, a, a time ship. Mm -hmm. and I, perhaps you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So to begin with the fact that Bologna takes this story of somebody who's from another country and who's not at the site of the massacre and is actually alone during a lot of this of the final weeks of the student movement um, is to take one small episode out of Elena Poniatowska's La Noche de Tlatelolco or The Massacre in Mexico as the English title is and expand on it. Um, and so you have in Poniatowska's book, this moment where as a reader, you find it very difficult to believe that somebody could survive on water from the tap and, and some toilet paper, um, which may, may not be in Poniatowska, but it is in Bolaño for 10 days in this bathroom. And so you have a sense of, of implausibility or inverosimilitude. And I think this often in Latin American literature would be something related to the fantastic or to um, magical realism. But what Bolaño does in Amulet and in um, some of his poetry and in one of his posthumous books called The Spirit of Science Fiction is to think about how certain tropes of science fiction need to be considered differently in a Latin American context. And the vision of the time tunnel or the time machine is repeated in Amulet and it enables clearly this kind of time travel that the narrator undergoes. It also seems to enable spatial travel that's quite incredible where she finds herself a witness over this valley at the end of the novel, or she finds herself um, in different people's houses at different times that don't necessarily seem to have a logical connection to where she was before. And one thing that considering science fiction and Bolaño in general has helped me think about is that the idea of an apocalypse or the end of the world is something that maybe only seems far away, although maybe less so recently in the United States or in other more privileged countries in the world. Whereas in, 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 in less developed or less privileged or poorer or more unjust context, the apocalypse is kind of always already there. And so, what would science fiction mean? First of all, it might not be that fictional. And second of all, it might not be that far in the future. So this idea that temporality changes depending on which country you live in or which country you grew up in or which country shapes the literary tradition you're most familiar with is something that this novel really challenges because of the way it kind of collapses and shuffles around temporality as a chronology or a teleology in a way that might suggest, like the predictions about literature, that the future is already here for a lot of people. Um, and that the traumas of the past are not only in the past, and they could be in the future for other places as well. So I think rereading Amulet over the last couple of days has shown me how even in a novel where I don't remember having seen it before, um, this idea of of science fiction as something that needs to be read differently within Latin America, or that helps us understand something about 
an idea of progress that Latin America has had imposed upon it. Um, and 1968 is one of those narratives of progress. Uh, just as kind of an aside, the Olympics were in Mexico City in 1968. So there was a sense that the Olympics meant that Mexico is becoming a modern nation and that in fact, destroying the student movement was necessary in order to host the Olympics in order to prove Mexico's modernity, even at the cost of an act of barbarism, let's say. Um, and so that kind of temporality of modernity and progress is something that if you think about a different way of looking at the apocalypse in science fiction terms would, would connect with um, a critique of that kind of time, that critique of that kind of progress. I think that, that, that yeah, that's fantastic, right? So you've got this whole you know, narrative of progress and, and development and, and modernization which is retold in various ways in, in Mexico, this is connected to Porfirio Diaz, right? And then, and then the revolution right. and, and so different versions right. of that and left-wing versions and right-wing versions of, of that too, right? Mm -hmm. And right. then um, and then Bolaño here is, is, is trying to say, well, you know, to complicate that, right? To look at this looking forwards and looking backwards um, so that she remembers the future, for instance, when she's in, the, in this bathroom in this um, time ship. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested by what you had to say with the, with the ways in which Bolaño is uh, complicating right, our notions of temporality, that, that that's also something to do with place or, or, or space or geography or geopolitics. And, um, and I'm struck, well, you know, La Couture, as we've said, is, is Uruguayan, who's, who's displaced, although then she presents herself in, in some way the mother of all Mexican poetry, the mother of all Mexican poets. Um, you've got she, she she initially is with these Spanish exiles as well, right? Mm -hmm. In in Mexico, that's sort of the one of the opening scenes, and then of course you have the figure figure of Arturo Bellano, mm -hmm. who is an alter ego in some way, in many ways, right? Of of Bolaño himself, who was a Chilean in, in Mexico and who subsequently becomes displaced in, in, in other ways to when he moves to to Catalonia to, to Spain where he's writing this book from I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, that geography or that sense of geography in the book the way in which space and time intersect or problematize each other perhaps yeah sure I think one thing that you often come across when you first start reading about Bolaño is the question of which country he belongs to <laughs> Um, and in a sort of classic writer response in his um, address to the Romulo Gallegos Prize jury and audience, he says the only passport a writer needs is to write well, which is one of those sort of, like I said, kind of classic writer responses. Um, he says he's still a Chilean, but he certainly doesn't say he's a Chilean writer. And I think the way that the novel starts with a Uruguayan who's helping keep house for two Spanish exile poets, even though they don't really necessarily need or want her to keep house there, um, really foregrounds the topic of exile and displacement. And I think clearly Pedro Garfias and Leon Felipe are exiles. Bolaño and Belano are not necessarily exiles. Bolaño left Chile with his parents when he was 15 in 1968. Uh, then he went to Spain in 1977, uh, more or less of his, of his will without having been forced to go to either place. Um, Alcira Soust, the woman who Auxilia La Couture is based on, went to Mexico to study um, pedagogy, I believe, uh, of her own choice. So you have a sense of exile, but also a sense of displacement. And I think what it does is it shows a certain specificity of literary and artistic production, but it also, emphasizes commonalities across space and time having to do with violence and exile and the violence of displacement as well. So you have the figure of the painter Remedios Varo, whose house Auxilio either visits or doesn't visit, which she remembers from the bathroom um, and then returns to the house in 1973, 10 years after she had first visited it. And when she visits that house, she sees the painting that Remedios Varos had done, Varro had done of a valley. And then that valley returns at the end of the novel. But 
with this um, kind of combination of exile artists and exile writers, you get a sense of how these topics have crossed space and time, like I said before. But when she returns to the house in 1973, she hears the story of Orestes and Erigone, which is also a story of exile, where Erigone is forced out of the home of Orestes after Orestes rapes her and then continues to, to spend time with her at night. And you get a sense then that what Bologna is, is doing in this book is situating a very important moment for Mexican national history within a much broader context of artistic representations of violence and exile. And I think it's a critique then of the territoriality that violence and exile often go with. You do not belong here. You must be forced out of this place. You must go somewhere else. You must find a home somewhere else. Bologna was trying to say, let's not try to define a literary tradition within a certain national border, I think it would be better to look at how focuses on borders and territories actually help reinforce or create, even in literature, the violence that we are trying to condemn. That's fascinating, especially given that in some way, right, you know, the center of this novel is this such a constricted space, right? It's the bathroom, right? right, that, right. That, that she can't leave. <laughs> and yet, that, right, that this fits, you know, within that space, there's this extraordinary expansive imagination, um, this extraordinary expansive vision uh, of both temporally and, and spatially. Uh, let, let's talk. I, 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 let's talk briefly about the relationship between fact and fiction. Okay, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Because this is set in a particular historical context. It picks up on a on a historical event with, with real people. Uh, there's a whole load of real people, some, but some of whom are disguised. Their names are changed. Uh, you get the sort of doubling of of Bolaño himself, who, who features, and this is, and 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 yet these are also these are also figures who sort of feature in Bolaño's wider literary universe. And in fact, this whole book, in some ways, is a is a is taken from another book that Bolaño writes, the the Savage Detectives, mm -hmm. and and you were saying earlier how um, what's his name Epifanio, I forget what his name is exactly, also features in in, in, in other books and poetry and so on of Bolaño. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between sort of Bolaño's literary universe. And there's, there's a reference, this is strange reference to, to six, 2666 in this right. book, not to right. the book, right. but to the date. Right. Right. Um, so, so Bolaño sort of constructs this literary universe, but it's also tied in interesting ways and, and, and yet escapes in interesting ways uh, from uh, uh, what we could call a, a real universe or something so more... more uh, the historical universe, I suppose. I wonder if you could talk about that. So in addition to the temporal and spatial frontiers that the novel challenges, it challenges this frontier between fact and fiction. And one really interesting way it does it is in the final chapter, where Auxilio La Couture, who is based on an actual person, Alcira Seuss, who was friends off and on with the Bolaño family in Mexico City, has just returned from this valley where one of the last things she mentions is Las Alturas de Machu Picchu, which of course refers to the poem by Pablo Neruda, another actual person. Um, and when she returns to the bathroom, once again, after this visit to this valley where she sees the youth falling into the abyss, she returns to Arturo Bellano, who's the alter ego of Roberto Bolaño. And for the first time in the novel, two more of his friends, and maybe three, are mentioned mentioned with their pseudonyms, Ulysses Lima, Laura Juari, and Felipe Muller. And these are actual, these are pseudonyms of actual friends of Bolaños when he was living in Mexico City. And so in some way, it's a return to Bolaños years as a poet and a young writer in Mexico City, moments of pleasure and adventure. Um, and I think what this the fact that this is the first time you see this group of poets will connect this book with other of Bolaño's books. And so this is one more thing that Bolaño does here in terms of crossing frontiers, is he crosses frontiers between separate texts. So there is really no sense that one book ends and another begins, instead that they overlap quite a bit. And a lot of this overlapping is tied in with his own life. And I think one of the most productive and critical and generative things about Bolaño is that 
he makes you read his other books in order to try to put these things together. And then once you've read them, you have to go back and read the first ones again. And I think that kind of rereading and that persistence of reading, which is crystallized in the product predictions that the angel um, listens to Auxilio make, means that literature means something that we cannot predict in a future time and in a different place that we cannot know. And that that unexpectedness is that perhaps generosity and bravery of these poets that he associates with his time in Mexico. That is a beautiful place to end. I think that's, <laughs> I, th I think that's fantastic. Recuperating the bravery of the of the student movement of the political movement um but also the bravery and beauty and the persistence of of, of poetry and of literature and and on the need for us to not only read but keep reading and 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 reread and and persist in our reading okay thank this has been you. fantastic thank you so much uh ryan for again your generosity of time and and your um, perspective and, and expertise on the, all this. It's been immensely productive. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed it.